so here we'll begin with our very first session of the day uh, that is the may may brit moser session uh, it is named after the scientist may brit moser who received the nobel prize in physiology or medicine in 2014 uh, for the discovery of cells that constitute a positioning system in the brain uh, i would here like to welcome our chairpersons uh, dr rupen panchal from ahmedabad and dr vishwa unarkat from vadodara Uh, i would request dr rupen panchal to introduce our speaker please sir thank you uh, i would like to introduce our speaker dr nitesh guhardia he is the founder and director of tecod diabetes and endocrine center of nevada and he is a professor of medicine at st george university he has numerous awards and recognition helme charitable trust award for the outstanding research in type 1 diabetes two times He has received a junior faculty award for outstanding research, University at Buffalo. First prize in best case research reports category in American Geriatric Society. National meeting was which was held in Chicago, 2009. Hereby, I would like to invite Dr. Nitesh for the presentation. Hello, everyone. Welcome to SwasthyCon uh, 2021 conference, and. Uh, i am very uh, uh, excited to be uh, talking about uh, sclt2 inhibition and how it can help unlock uh, cardiovascular protection and also uh, renal uh, protection this is the outline of my presentation today we'll briefly talk about the uh, burden of cardiovascular disease in type 2 diabetes and how sclt2 inhibitors can um help us lower uh, the burden of cardiovascular disease overall and then uh, in the second half we will talk about the burden of renal disease in the setting of type 2 diabetes and how uh, sclt2 inhibition can unlock renal protection uh, and then as an icing on the cake uh we'll spend some time talking about the possible uh, underlying mechanisms responsible for uh cardiovascular and and renal protection and then i'll show you uh, some of the cases from uh my practice that really supports our discussion uh very nicely now when you think about patients with diabetes Uh, they are five times uh, at a higher risk of uh, myocardial infarction up to six times increased risk of stroke at uh, twice as high uh, risk of cardiovascular death and we also know that these patients uh, frequently have impaired renal function uh, which further uh, enhances their risk of cardiovascular disease uh, and stroke in the united states uh, when uh, the cdc looked at the data uh, it turns out that there is one cardiovascular death uh, every uh, uh, 37 uh, seconds uh, and um, we have also learned that if you have a history of uh, type 2 diabetes or a history of mi your life expectancy is uh, reduced by 6 years compared to an average individual uh, but if you have a history of type 2 diabetes and myocardial infarction your life expectancy uh, is reduced by 13 years in the last uh, two decades uh, the uh, uh, risk of or the incidence of cv death in patients with diabetes shown in red uh, has gone down compared to uh, the general population and this can be attributable to a higher use of aspirin statins acrbs and, and beta blockers but uh, it's not enough and in 2015 uh, when we looked at the uh, statistics it turns out that uh, patients with diabetes still have one and a half times greater incidence of cardiovascular death we also know from this beautiful study that patients with diabetes have 100 more events per 1000 patient years uh, of uh, congestive uh, heart failure compared to those without diabetes uh, and we have also learned that 
uh, in patients with diabetes shown in blue, the heart failure can present almost a decade earlier compared to the general population. And on the right-hand side, we are showing that a third of these patients uh, with type two diabetes have unrecognized heart failure. With every hospitalization for heart failure, uh, you would be uh, surprised to know that your ejection fraction uh, keeps uh, declining. And in United States, and maybe the global data are also very similar, wherein uh, every eighth death is attributable to a heart failure. Uh, these patients also carry a very high mortality rate. Uh, patients admitted uh, to the hospital for heart failure uh, have 75% uh, of mortality uh, at five years. Why does this happen? Uh, one of the reasons we believe is the fact that uh, the underlying pathophysiological disturbances in, in type 2 diabetes, and this includes upregulation of the renin angiotensin system, uh, along with arterial stiffness and third spacing that is often seen. Uh, and we also know that uh, these patients have hypertension and renal hyper, hyperfiltration. And all this pathophysiological disturbance uh, uh, kind of become uh, the ingredients for uh, a perfect storm called diabetic cardiomyopathy. Uh, and uh, no surprise that in one of the studies, we saw that 68% of patients who had diabetes no longer than five years already had uh, evidence of, of asymptomatic LV dysfunction. Uh, what it means for us as clinicians, uh, every second patient that we see in our clinic with type 2 diabetes is expected to develop heart failure uh, in the future. Uh, glucose control is very important for lowering your microvascular complications and will continue to be the cornerstone of, of therapy, but uh, hasn't shown uh, to lower the uh, macrovascular risk and glucose control has also not shown to lower the heart failure outcomes. And we have a very good data from the legendary trials, uh, as we can see here, uh, including UKPDS, uh, ACCORD, uh, ADVANCE, and NVADD. So, so how does uh, SGLT2 inhibitors come to our rescue? Uh, can they uh, help lower uh, uh, the incidence of cardiovascular death and the hospitalization for a heart failure. Uh, so let's dive into the depths of uh, some of the evidence that we have uh, in front of us. And we'll talk about uh, this uh, data that has been shown with empagliflozin, depagliflozin, uh, canagliflozin, and more recently, uh, asotagliflozin. Uh, all these trials are very similar, uh, and we'll talk about some of the minor differences uh, as we go into uh, details. Uh, with the exception that sotagliflozin uh, 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 included patients with diabetes and recent worsening of heart failure. Uh, so let's take a look at the EMPAREG outcome trial. Uh, very simple study design. Uh, here we have patients with type 2 diabetes, uh, and all of them have a history of established cardiovascular uh, disease. Uh, one group we randomized to placebo, and then the other two groups to two different doses of, of Jardians. And when I show you the results, we have combined the 10 and 25 milligram dose groups because uh, both groups benefited equally and there was no uh, dose response uh, or, or relationship seen uh, in actual results. Uh, being a CVOT trial, being a cardiovascular outcome trial, uh, they had to be on the standard of care treatment. And the standard of care treatment for somebody uh, who has a history of established CV disease is to be on good dose of aspirin, ACRBs, statins, and, and beta blockers. Uh, and so we followed that very closely. And since these patients have diabetes, whether they are in the placebo or the Jardian treated group, investigators could choose any uh, glucose lowering agent with the exception that they, they could not choose a uh, SGLT2 inhibitor as it could confirm uh, uh, the results. What did we see in this trial? In this trial, we saw that we, the Jardian treated groups had 
relative risk reduction in CV death uh, on top of what is seen and experienced with aspirin, statins, ACRBs, and, and beta blockers. And uh, this benefit was seen as early as 59 days of Jardian's therapy and, and was uh, also uh, maintained uh, long term. Uh, we also saw a reduction in the three point maze, uh, which is the composite endpoint of CV death, non fatal MI, and non fatal stroke in this trial. However, it was primarily driven by a reduction in CV death, as we can see uh, in the bottom half uh, of this uh, slide. Uh, this benefit was again seen in all patients who received Jardian's therapy, irrespective of their age, gender. Uh, ethnicity, type of uh, renal impairment, a uh, type of anti-diabetic therapy, type of uh, uh, anti-hypertensive therapy, and also irrespective of the type of uh, 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 cardiovascular uh, uh, disease. So the message is clear. Whoever got Jardians in the trial uh, benefited from uh, a reduction in CV death and three-point maze. Uh, then followed the CANVAS program, which was the CVOT trial done with Invokana, also known as uh, canagliflozin. Very similar uh, a trial with few differences. Uh, one difference is the fact that in this trial, there were 50% of patients who represented primary prevention and the remaining 50% represented secondary prevention versus EMPEREG outcome trial was primarily a secondary prevention uh, trial. Uh, this trial also had a slightly longer follow-up of about uh, six and a half years. Uh, again, uh, these patients had to be on the standard of care treatment when it come, came to lowering cardiovascular risk and also uh, when it came to using uh, the standard glucose lowering uh, agents uh, with the exception that they could not be on uh, any other SGLT2 inhibitor as it can introduce uh, confounding. Uh, here too, we see a reduction in three-point maze around 18%, uh, percent, uh, uh, and this applies to 50% of the patients who represent primary prevention and also 50% of the patients or the remaining 50% of the patients who represent a secondary prevention uh, as well. Uh, and then uh, this uh, was followed by uh, the, the uh, publication of the DECLARE trial. And uh, the DECLARE trial is the a uh, trial that has uh, has been conducted with 10 milligrams of depagliflozin, also known as or as Farsiga, and in this trial you have 60% of patients who represent primary prevention, uh, uh, and 40% of patients who, who sort of represent secondary prevention. And out of all the three trials that we are talking about, uh, a declared trial has the largest uh, primary prevention uh, uh, population. What did we see in this particular trial? Here we see, again, a 27% relative risk reduction overall in hospitalization for heart failure. Uh, as you can see in the first SIGA treated group, uh, the benefit evolves uh, fairly early on. And when you specifically look at patients uh, who had uh, uh, just had multiple risk factors but hadn't developed an event, i.e. primary prevention, uh, category, we saw even a greater benefit. We saw 36% uh, relative risk reduction. Again, uh, this was seen within a year of uh, depagliflozin uh, uh, treatment. Uh, and then uh, we have the landmark DEPA-HF trial. And uh, in this trial, uh, patients received uh, uh, Farsiga. And uh, the population that we include here uh, has uh, a heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. 45% of these patients have diabetes, uh, but the remaining 55% doesn't have uh, diabetes. And so when you look at the overall uh, patient population in the DEPA-HF trial, uh, there is a 26% uh, reduction in CV death or hospitalization for uh, heart failure on top of uh, standard of care uh, or treatment for for patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Here we show a side-to-side -side comparison of the results uh, in patients with diabetes on the left-hand side and in patients without diabetes uh, in the right, on the right-hand side of the slide. And as you can see, the benefit 
is almost uh, identical, uh, whether you have diabetes or not. Uh, then uh, came the EMPEROR trial, uh, which was uh, uh, done in patients with heart failure. Uh, and here we use EMPA uh, gliflozin. Uh, in the interest of time, won't go into uh, the details of this trial, but uh, uh, apart from few uh, uh, differences here and there, uh, this trial was uh, very similar uh, to your DEPA-HF trial and also showed very similar uh, a benefit uh, in terms of reducing CV death or hospitalization for heart failure. And this was seen across all the subgroups uh, irrespective of their age, gender, race, um, uh, irrespective of their baseline ejection fraction and the cause of, of heart failure. Uh, so uh, now let's um, uh, uh, quickly uh, switch gears and uh, uh, in, in the subsequent half, uh, talk about uh, the burden of, of renal disease uh, in, the, in the setting of type two uh, diabetes. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, my esteemed colleagues attending this conference, um, uh, they are very familiar uh, with the statistics that diabetes is the uh, leading cause of uh, end-stage kidney disease. Uh, um, and uh, when you think about the burden of uh, the disease, uh, every uh, third patient with type 2 diabetes has a chronic kidney disease and 8% of these adults also happen to have uh, albuminuria defined as uh, a spot urine albumin creatinine ratio over uh, 300. Have we done something for this type of patients uh, historically? And the answer is yes. Uh, we have hit them very hard with the RAS blockade and we have used uh, AS and ARBs uh, in these uh, patients. And when we look collectively, uh, uh, at the entire uh, uh, ARB class, uh, approximately we have seen about 16 to 20 percent uh, uh, relative reduction in, in renal risk, which is defined as a composite of doubling of serum creatinine and stage uh, uh, kidney disease uh, or death uh, in patients with type 2 diabetes and diabetic kidney disease, DKD, also CKD however you want to uh, uh, phrase it. Um, we also uh, have learned uh, that um, as your GFR declines, uh, your hospitalization for heart failure also goes up. And uh, it can be as high as uh, 30%. When you look at the hospitalization for heart failure uh, in patients with GFR ranging from 15 to 30 compared to 4% uh, in patients with GFR of 90 or, or higher. Uh, and then uh, this sort of sets up the platform very nicely to talk about the Credence trial. And in the Credence trial, uh, what we did was something simple. Uh, we included adults 30 years and, uh, and older uh, with a uh, history of type 2 diabetes uh, and uh, estimated GFR could be as low as 30 with a urine albumin creatinine ratio ranging from 300 to 5,000. They're already on max tolerated dose of ACE or, or ARBs for at least four weeks prior to the start of the trial. One group gets 100 milligrams of Invokana and the other group gets placebo. And while on, uh, on Invokana, while on canagliflozin, uh, the patients continued the treatment even if the GFR dropped below 30 uh, until chronic dialysis was initiated or uh, they received a, a kidney transplant. So very gutsy trial, uh, but it yielded uh, very good results. And when you look at the uh, primary outcome in this uh, group of patients with a mean GFR of 56 and a median UACR of 930, uh, what do we see? Uh, we see a 30% uh, relative risk reduction uh, in the uh, primary uh, composite endpoint of end-stage kidney disease, doubling of serum creatinine or renal or, or cardiovascular death, and as you can see uh, from the graph, uh, this benefit is seen uh, after 12 months of therapy. And so after 12 months, as you can see, the curves uh, start to separate uh, uh, very nicely. Uh, when you look at the rate of decline in GFR, Invokana treated patients uh, showed a decline of 1.85 ml per minute per meter square per year compared to 4.59 ml per minute per meter square per year in the placebo 
or treated group. Uh, so it does slow down uh, the decline in GFR. And these patients also benefited from uh, a lower uh, a risk of hospitalization uh, for uh, heart failure. Now, the DEPA-CKD trial uh, is a very similar trial, very similar to Credence, uh, but was done with uh, the depa gliflozin molecule uh, in patients with a chronic kidney disease. The paper, again, is published in a New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, the main difference uh, is the fact that uh, this particular trial had 33% of patients that had no history of diabetes and also had 13% of patients uh, that had estimated GFR uh, below 30 uh, prior to uh, the start of the trial, prior to receiving uh, a depagliflozin therapy. Again, in this trial, we see uh, that it met, met its primary endpoint, which is uh, a composite of sustained decline uh, in the estimated GFR of at least 50% end-stage kidney disease or death from renal uh, or cardiovascular causes. And then uh, we also saw reduction in hospitalization for heart failure, uh, as we had earlier talked about uh, or, uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the Credence uh, trial. Um, and uh, the rate of decline in GFR also uh, is uh, very similar to what we saw uh, with, uh, in Wakana over time. Uh, compared to uh, the placebo-treated patients. So let's talk about the, uh, the possible mechanisms uh, that uh, could potentially explain uh, the cardiovascular and renal protection. So let's talk about the cardiovascular protection first. What are the possible working hypotheses uh, that we have? Uh, one of the possibilities could be uh, uh, that ketosis may be cardioprotective. Now, patients on SGLT2 inhibitors have doubling of their serum ketones when compared to baseline. So they have ketosis, but not necessarily ketoacidosis. And because of this excess ketones floating around in the circulation, they become a preferred fuel for the failing heart because your ketones, they generate a good amount of energy or the same amount of energy as your glucose, lactate, or pyruvate uh, a molecule does, but with just one fourth of the oxygen consumption. So it, it, it creates a readily uh, available fuel or works as a readily available fuel without increasing uh, the myocardial workload. We also see erythropoiesis in patients on SGLT2 inhibition. There's a three to 5% increase in hemoglobin and hematocrite, and that can also uh, reduce the oxygen carrying capacity of red blood cells and therefore reduce your myocardial workload. We also believe that uh, the SGLT2 inhibition gives you normalization of serum magnesium. So by reducing hypomagnesemia, you're reducing ventricular arrhythmias, which is uh, the most common cause of a sudden cardiac death and reduction in uric acid helps. And as, as diuretic, it does reduce afterload and, and uh, uh, preload. Uh, people with type 2 diabetes have twice as high uric acid compared to the general population. And so reduction in uric acid raises a question, could lowering the uric acid be uh, beneficial? Uh, what about the, the renal protection? And so when you block the glucose reabsorption, you also block the sodium reabsorption in the proximal tubule with your SGLT2 inhibition, and you present a higher sodium load uh, or to your distal tubule. And in your distal tubule, then your macular densa that senses this high sodium loss and that triggers the vasoconstriction of the efferent arteriole, which reduces the glomerular flow and also reduces the glomerular pressure, which in turn could uh, be uh, beneficial for the kidneys. Now, ACRBs, uh, they reduce glomerular flow and glomerular pressure by uh, dilating your efferent uh, arterial. Uh, and then the ketosis and erythropoiesis, along with uh, normalization of serum magnesium and uric acid, is also believed to be renoprotective because diabetic kidney is believed to be hypoxic at baseline. And this uh, four elements uh, help reduce the workload of your uh, kidneys. Uh, so let me show you uh, 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 the cases from my clinical practice that really uh, supports the discussion that we have had so far very nicely. 
And here I have case one, two, and three. Uh, they have a mean urine albumin creatinine ratio of over 1,000, and case three has USCR over 500. I concomitantly start a GLP-1 and SGLT2 inhibitor in this uh, group of patients. And when I do that, uh, here you can see a very nice uh, trend towards reduction in proteinuria. And case one, as you can see, comes from a USCR of two grams per day uh, to a USCR of close to 150 to 200 over a period of, of 30 months. He was very close to getting dialysis when I saw him the very first time. And he said, Dr. Kuhadia, can you do something? I don't like to go on dialysis. And this is what I did for him. Again, these are patients with uncontrolled uh, type 2 uh, diabetes. Uh, this paper is under review by one of the Willy journals called Clinical Case Reports, and uh, most likely will get published very shortly. But I've mentioned the reference uh, at the bottom. Uh, what about their creatinine? So overall, in all the four cases, their creatinine remains stable. We don't see a doubling of serum creatinine uh, uh, over a follow-up uh, period shown here, with the exception that case one had an episode of vomiting, diarrhea, and dehydration, and the creatinine went up. But with hospitalization and IV hydration, it came down uh, very nicely. And none of these four cases had any cardiovascular event um, uh, 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 as well. And uh, none of them have required dialysis. Uh, and when you look at the mean uh, GFR in all these four cases is about 23. So these are patients who are this close uh, to hemodialysis and uh, uh, kind of were rescued from uh, getting a hemodialysis done the way uh, I just uh, uh, showed you. Now, remember that, uh, and in the interest of time, I didn't discuss this, but we see about 30 to 40% regression or reduction in proteinuria with SGLG2 inhibition and about 20 to 24% with GLP-1. So when you concomitantly use your GLP-1 and SGLG2 inhibition, these are the kind of uh, results that one expects uh, to see. Uh, and uh, I hope that uh, this clinical cases of mine and the experience shown here uh, will uh, uh, help and enhance your clinical practices and will be beneficial uh, to your patients uh, uh, as well. Uh, so with that being said, I will stop here um, and uh, please enjoy the Swasticon 2020 uh, one conference and um, um, I invite you all to maybe visit Reno uh, one of those days. So again, uh, thank you so much for, for your uh, attention and I look forward to joining you live for the Q&A session. Thank you. <clears throat> That's a nice presentation, Dr. Nitesh. And uh, yes, we have a question. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Can I go ahead with the question, sir? Yes, yes, please go ahead. Uh, this is a question from Dr. Sanjay Patil. Uh, he wants to ask what percentage of HbA1c reduction you can expect with SCLT2 inhibitor in EGFR? And Less than 30. Less than 45 and less than 30. Whenever GFR is less than 45 and less than 30. Yes. How much we can expect reduction in HbA1c with GLT2 inhibitors? Yes, yes. That's a fantastic question. And so when you look at the A1c reduction with GFR below 45, typically uh, we see about 0.2, uh, 0.3% uh, A1c lowering. If your uh, baseline A1c's uh, are 9%, and under, and that is the very reason in the beginning uh, when this SGLT2 inhibitors were launched, uh, FDA said, hey, you know, it's not cost effective to add uh, this costly class of medication uh, in patients with GFR below 45 or below 30, if you're just gonna get a 0.2 to 0.3% uh, A1C lowering because one could uh, get similar A1C lowering with lifestyle modification and uh, including exercise. But uh, since that time frame, um, what we have seen is that even with GFR below 45, although you may not get as much A1C lowering, but then you have you still see uh, all the other cardiometabolic and cardiorenal benefits that we just discussed in the previous um, you know, 24 to 25 minutes. So great question again, uh, Dr. Patel. And um, I hope that answers your, your question. Uh, good morning, Dr. Nitesh. This is Dr. Vishwa Unadkat here. Yes, hi. 
Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks a lot. I must say, must congratulate uh, on your uh, lucid talk, and uh, thank you for sharing your own experience as well, your own publication. I hope it's going to get published very soon. It was a very interesting case uh, dealing with your uh, albuminuria patient who were on, almost on the verge of dialysis, right? Uh, yes, yes. And actually, let me share some good news with you. So, incidentally, just this morning, I received the correspondence from the journal that uh, uh, you know, they sent it out for peer review to five different reviewers. And, okay. and based on that, uh, they have accepted this paper uh, for publication. So it's gonna come out in Clinical Case Reports Journal, which is a sister journal of, of Willie Publishers okay. that also publishes diabetes, obesity, and metabolism. Okay. So I'm very excited. The first hurdle is passed. What's that? The first hurdle uh, is passed. First hurdle yes. is passed, yes. I first have a small question for you. Yes. Uh, yes. I was going through the minor detailing of DAPA CKD. As you, you yes. just mentioned that uh, there were patients having EGFR even less than 30, right? I think yes. uh, somewhere 12 or 13 percent of patient was there. Uh, does, uh, does the paper actually suggest uh, any of the outcome of those 13 percent of paper, uh, patients or there's a post hoc analysis is yet to come? Uh, yes, yeah, so so I think we, we are looking forward for the, the subgroup analysis of those specific uh, group of patients more in detail, uh, but we already know that even those 13% uh, of patients with GFR below 30 benefited equally uh, as the others, uh, as the others uh, uh, in the group. And so, uh, again, I'm probably jumping ahead of time, but at least in the United States, I anticipate that uh, FDA might grant the authorization to depagliflozin for use in CKD patients with GFR as low as 25 based on, on the depa-CKD trial. Okay, so that is that, uh, that this particular finding leading us towards the patient who are on the verge of dialysis to think for every nephrologist, every physician taking care of that patient, give a trial of SGLT2 for a small while, probably you may yes. avoid dialysis, is it so? Absolutely, absolutely. Because right. as you know, once they once they get on dialysis, it's like a death sentence. You know, their cardiovascular risk is, is very high. The progression of atherosclerosis is very fast. And so if we can do something, uh, and, and as you saw, the data are very encouraging. So if we can do this to prevent patients from getting onto dialysis, I think there's nothing like it in my opinion. Great, great, great. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Yes, you're welcome.